Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the LSD for this online event, Remembering the 1970 Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. I'm Armina Ishkanian, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy and also the executive director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program at the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. I'm very, very pleased to be here this evening to welcome Jill Morris, Gareth Millward, and Myra, Miro Griffiths to the LSE. They will each speak for about 10 minutes on Alf Morris's involvement in the 1970 Act and his work on behalf of people with disabilities. They'll offer perspectives on the legacy of the act and discuss how debates and public awareness around disability have changed in the years since the act was passed. I'll give you an introduction to all of the speakers and then I'll invite them in turn to speak. Jill Morris has over 30 years experience in increasing lobbying transparency and improving public affairs practices in the UK. Jill is the daughter of Lord Alf Morris of Manchester. She has a wealth of Northern experience, including establishing the Regional Policy Forum, supporting the English Regions Network, and securing clients from across the private and public sector in the North. Dr. Miro Griffiths is a Leverhulme Research Fellow in Disability Studies at the University of Leeds. Disability Studies. He has been involved in disability rights since the age of 14 and has collaborated with various organizations, human rights institutes, and government departments on a wide range of issues pertaining to disability politics and social theory. In May 2014, Dr. Griffiths was awarded an MBE, Member of the Order of the British Empire, as recognition of his service to disabled people. Dr. Gareth Millward is Wellcome Trust Research Fellow at the University of Warwick and, his P and he received his PhD at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2014. The dissertation focused on how the category of disability policy was created and then evolved between 1965 and 1995. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for this evening's event is hashtag LSE Disability Act 50, all one word. This online event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. This evening, I would also like to thank Rachel and Susan, who will be doing BSL interpretation for us this evening, and also Heather from My Clear Text, who will be providing closed captioning for this event. This event is linked to the launch of the online exhibition at the LSE Library titled Alf Morris and the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. The exhibition is now live, and we'll put the link to the exhibition in the chat. As always, there will be an opportunity for members of the audience to put questions to the panelists. To submit your questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Questions will be sent to me as chair and I will pose as many possible questions to the speakers, time permitting. Please let us know in posing your question, your name and affiliation. I note that we are very keen to hear from our LSE students, alumni, and also incoming students. So if that's who you are, please let us know. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over the, um, the proverbial microphone to Jill Morris, our first speaker. Thank you uh, very much. And I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, on the Zoom uh, to speak with you all uh, to this evening. Um, I want to talk about my dad, uh, Alf Morris, um, and the architect of the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act. Um, I want to talk about the man. I also want to talk about the act. Um, and I also want to, and Joy will do, talk about the legacy as we all know, we live in interesting times. Uh, and if anything, the coronavirus has uh, shone a light on the uh, huge disparities and inequalities that prevail in our society. 
But let me take you back to uh, when my dad was born. He was born into poverty in a family of nine um, and uh, in a place that Engels referred to as hell on earth. Um, his father, my grandfather, who I never met, they and all my grandparents died before I was born, as was such the state of the times in those days. People lived in poverty. Um, my grandmother had, you know, was ultimately a single mother. And if it hadn't been for charity, they literally wouldn't have been able to move from the slums to a, a, a house which was, which was basically provided by, by the church. So how did a, a young lad called Alf in such a big family living in poverty go on to um, basically change the lives of millions of people worldwide? Well, um, against the odds is the answer. Um, but fast forward, uh, things were very different then. People did have long-term illnesses. We were coming out of the war. Uh, I could go on forever about all the stories and the unfairnesses and the, uh, the, <laughs> the experience he had. But he joined the Labour Corps Party very early. It's, in those days, it's the Labour League of Youth. Um, and he became the national chair of that, which obviously set him on the way. But started working a brewery as you always did you had uh, you had to uh, earn a some kind of uh, income uh, and in within that he learned basically some of the basic numeracy skills but um, Alf was always uh, busy doing jobs and uh, even though he couldn't stand working at the brewery um, you know the beer that you got paid uh, was really was really important uh, in terms of what you got back from from other people's uh, so it's a very different world uh, so um, he met my mother uh, the lovely uh, lady Irene um, at, at a, a Labour League of Youth or the Young Socialists rally and these people were born with fight because it, it didn't have to tell them about the injustices they were actually living in a very unequal society so socialism was very much there um uh he he went to uh night school he taught himself he was lucky enough to go on uh to Ruskin College in Oxford and from there he was obviously a bright chap uh, really having left school at 15, uh, 14 to end up at St. Catherine's College um, uh, on a scholarship um, was quite phenomenal. Even then, he was still championing the Labour history, at, uh, Labour, Labour um, uh, a career there and became a, a parliamentary uh, candidate, first in Liverpool and then in Withenshaw moved into uh, this great place with Ensure, which was new council housing and estates uh, with my maternal grandmother, who was then uh, had rheumatoid arthritis and was in a wheelchair of sorts. It was very much a wicker sort of basket, to be honest. Um, so yes, we moved into council housing and um, basically dad became the member of parliament in 1964, uh, with Harold Wilson. Uh, if you haven't already understood by now, he was a bit of a fighter and always was somebody with the moral high ground. So how did, how did he progress to pass this amazing piece of private members legislation, probably the most significant piece of private members legislation that has ever hit the statue book? And I say that not because he's my father, because it's true. Um, so that determination um, came about really by fluke, um, if not accident. Uh, he was on a delegation um, and his brother, Charles, who's also an MP of the area where uh, they used to live in Openshaw, and he, uh, Uncle Charlie, to sort of said, well, I'll put, Alf, I'll put Alf into the private members ballot. And lo and behold, who came out number one? Um, but Alf, so when he got back, he all of a sudden was inundated with lots of <laughs> requests for all kinds of pieces of legislation. You're very, you're very lucky to get um, a piece of your own legislation through 
um, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, even worse now when, you know, in the last year or whatever, to try and get that piece of legislation through. Um, and uh, yeah, he had to fought, he fought hard. Um, and why did he choose disability? Largely because of personal experience. You have to go back and think, even in, it seems incredible, 50 years ago, in my lifetime, you did not see disabled people. They were almost, they were invisible, uh, barely acknowledged, uh, you know, um, even, you know, I, I often say the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act was so incredible as a name. And then when you think about it, because they're not, that's not the language that we now use at all. But in those days, people were chronically sick and long term illnesses were prevalent. A lot of those, and indeed, my grandparents died uh, basically of poverty uh, because of those conditions. So that he saw basically some, uh, you know, some constituents uh, in what, unable to access a building. And then he said, I know Irene, that's my mum. I know what I'm going to do. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make it possible for disabled people to lead an independent life and have that access. So it was quite significant. The act was a significant piece of legislation. Nothing ever like it um, in the world. It would put an emphasis on accessibility, that buildings, transport were accessible. It seems absolutely crazy, but people were hidden away in those days in my lifetime. So um, there were huge barriers in terms of government and arguably if it wasn't for the calling of uh, an election in 19, um, 19, uh, 1970 uh, general election, it may well have fallen. Uh, my dad uh, fought for the inclusion of autism and dyslexia, the, the barriers he had to climb because people said, oh, it's going to be too much. You don't know what you're doing this. We can't afford it. So lo and, hope, lo and behold, yet another stroke of luck. And um, the chief whips and everybody in, in parliament said, if a Labour Party, a Labour government cannot do this, well, what are we all doing here? And with that, it was the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act 1970 uh, was rushed through in what they call the wash up and received royal assent in 1970, 50 years ago this year. Uh, so again, what did that actually, it opened up a floodgate having done, uh, unlocked all that potential, um, he became the first minister of the disabled, um, went worldwide with the charter for the disabled, the international charter for disabled people in China, in India, in the United States, went worldwide leading the way. And that's, that's the guy from Ancoats in Manchester who, Okay, he had a bit of luck, but he also had a lot of grit and determination to change the world. That went on, as we know, because we're also celebrating the Disabled Disability and Discrimination Act uh, 25 years this year. And my dad didn't do it on his own. He did it with, you know, he, again, he unlocked people like Jack Ashley. Can't, you know, forget him, um, the first deaf uh, Labour Member of Parliament, um, and uh, they were a bit of a, a double act, but there were countless other people who um, were behind that um, change, and I, it, I can't, you know, everything from mobility to making sure there was enough social welfare and support, uh, you know, attendance allowance, was so much that came out of that piece of legislation, which is quite hard for, for us to fathom today. So my thing on the legacy, the legacy is huge. He never stopped fighting. He continued to fight for equal rights really right up until his uh, death in 2012, which actually ironically or sadly was on the final 
the uh, final night of the Olympics and the opening of the Paralympics. Um, and, uh, you know, that, you know, I think particularly this year when we've all gone through such an experience and we've seen that, that inequality that is prevailing in our society and it's got, and it will get worse next year. But I think that fight and the need for us to move forward must go on. Um, and it, you know, that's where I hope we will talk about that a little bit more. But I'll just leave, it was my dad's belief and it was the, in one of these famous speeches, I think on Royal South, Royal Ascent was, was very much, his whole focus was about adding life to their years uh, and not just years to life. So that whole thing about quality of life, independent living was very core um, to his beliefs. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a story um, and uh, a bit of an insight to um, somebody I'm obviously very proud of. Thank you very much, Jill. That was lovely to hear and very informative. I wanna thank you for sharing your family's history with us this evening. And as you were speaking, I was thinking how the personal connects to the political, you know, and how that influences our paths through life. And I, I also found it very interesting how you linked, you know, how he went from local struggles to national struggles and ultimately to international and, and you know, global struggles to change the world, as you said, leaving a huge legacy. Um, there's a lot that you mentioned that I hope we'll discuss further in the Q&A. And just as a reminder to our audience, please continue to put in questions in the Q&A as we are very much looking forward to hearing from you. So now I will invite our second speaker, Miro, Dr. Miro Griffiths, um, to please um, begin his discussion. Thanks, Miro. Thank you, and, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here and, and to discuss this very important um, piece of legislation. And I think the reason why it's important is because I think it resembles a, uh, a shift in thinking about the marginalization and discrimination experienced by disabled people and moving out of the traditional overtly dominant medical perspectives of cure and rehabilitation and to an extent segregation. And although we still have segregation now, we can see with the act, the emphasis placed on removing barriers within the community. But the point here is that it, 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 it reorientates disability to become one that is heavily rooted in social policy and becomes a political issue as well and the recognition that to be a disabled person is to identify as a political subject and therefore the experiences of participation or exclusion is created um, and affected by the political economic social cultural arrangements within society so we, with this act, I think, and building on from what, uh, what Jill was saying, what we have is a focus on the way in which society is organized and how disabled people are supported to do that, uh, to be part of their communities and also influence their communities as well. So by placing emphasis on local authorities, identifying the prevalence of disability in society, but also to think through the different aspects of daily living from transport to access to public buildings to accessing education. What we have is a focus on the unnecessary barriers within society. And this is reflective of the language that comes from disabled activists in the UK. I'm thinking particularly of older organizations such as the Union of the Physically Impaired Against Segregation, the Pious, who were very firm in recognizing the unnecessary exclusion which is imposed upon disabled people. So the act is a way of thinking through how to compile the issues facing disabled people and to emphasize the importance of services uh, addressing those issues and trying to respond to some of these issues. Now, people like Hampton and, and other scholars 
have argued that perhaps there should have been more of a, uh, a mandatory need for, for uh, local authorities to act. Uh, there was questions, of course, about how local authorities collected uh, the data surrounding disabled people. And that's not a criticism of the, of the act at all. But what it shows, I think, and the reason why the act is so essential and, and integral to the functioning of our society, is it shows the ambivalence and to, and to an extent the disregard by uh, organizations, by those with incredible influence at the local level to address the, uh, the barriers that are placed in front of many communities. And of course, uh, in this context, disabled people. And I think there's also a broader point here as well, in that what the act is trying to achieve is that recognition that all disabled people are facing barriers and no longer is it tolerable or justifiable to say that we should have a deserving and undeserving uh, situation of supporting some people and other people will not necessarily have access to sufficient support. So the act is thinking about the broader welfare of all disabled people and recognizing the, the importance of making those financial contributions to uh, address these, the, the, the needs and to address the, the barriers within society. Now, of course, we can again, you know, look a little bit more into the depths of how local authorities responded to this. And there was questions around earmarking of, of, of uh, resources and funding to address this. And I think this is reflective of where we are now in terms of the concerns about the resources, the resource allocation towards uh, addressing disabled people's participation and inclusion within society. And I think something that, that we can reflect on perhaps in the Q&A is why it's essential that we have these le legislative acts and we have this framework to, not, I suppose, fall back on it in one sense when we are experiencing injustice, but also as a constant reminder that there is inequality within society and we do need to create the legal, social and political activities to address these barriers. So, so thinking about the act and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm struck when I, was, when I was reflecting on this for this talk, how much of this is, is rooted in the ideas of the independent living agenda, the notion of disabled people having the sufficient level of support to do the things that we want to do with our life, and how much of that is linked into the daily experiences within society. And even the ideas of say transport, and I, you know, I would encourage people to look at the work of somebody like uh, Professor Simon McEwen, who's doing an exhibition at the moment on the invalid carriages and the importance of transport. What is, int what is interesting about that piece of work and other scholars working in, in, in areas of disability studies is this recognition of when disabled people are given the sufficient support or when we start to address those barriers in society, which is what the act is trying to achieve, or was trying to achieve. We then provide opportunities for disabled people to mobilize, to decide what they want to do with their time, engage in the labor market perhaps, engage in their community, pursue interests, leisure activities and so on, or indeed mobilize for the purposes of activism and campaigning. So I think it is um, an important point to recognize that much of the campaigning and activism that followed the act, which was addressing other aspects of disabled people's marginalization, does rely on those legal, legal legislative infrastructures because it provides us with maybe not the absolute support that we need, and that's a question of resources and, and economic decisions and political objectives, but it does recognize that disabled people have an entitlement to support and have an opportunity to access the necessary support to mobilize and to have choice and control. And I think that's an important point when I think about the, 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 the legacy of the act, that recognition of moving away from traditional service-led policies and welfare institutions, as, Mark, as Professor Mark Priestley calls it, and thinking about developing a needs-led assessment. So thinking about, well, how do we collect the data of for disabled people in our communities? And then how do we ensure that we create the relevant policies to support sale people to identify needs, but also provide that sufficient support? And I think, you know, again, thinking about the legacy, what we have 
is a recognition of some common ground between policymakers who were responding to the importance of, of Lord Morris's ideas and, and perspective on civil people's participation in society. So the, the common ground between those policymakers responding to that and disabled people's movement and the activism who were calling for greater choice, more self-determination, a challenge to that institutionalization agenda, which again, hasn't gone away. And we can probably pick that up in the Q&A. There is still widespread institutionalization. There is still widespread segregation, but there is a orientation of policy towards focusing on the needs of the individual and responding to the needs rather than assuming that the answer should be segregation, institutionalization, or a focus on cure and rehabilitation. And I also, one other point I think is interesting about the act is how the, there was an emphasis placed on involving disabled people in committees associated with issues and matters affecting disabled people. And of course, this is reflective of those demands by activists for a recognition of nothing about us without us, ensuring that still people are included in those discussions, or even indeed are given the power and the influence to determine what policies should be in play, where emphasis should be. But where are we now? Well, the problem is that we have a precarious situation facing disabled people, and, I, and I probably that's an understatement. And I'm saddened by when we think about the UN, com the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of Disabled People identifying the UK as the first country to be in grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights. And more worryingly, the, the, the tolerance and the acceptance by broader society to not challenge that or not rise up to that. And of course, the distressing, well, in my view, distressing uh, response by the government to just refute those, um, those allegations or the evidence by the UN committee. And this is where I think disability policy now is in a state of paradox, because on the one hand, we have policy um, orientated towards supporting tail people, but we also have policy orientated towards perpetuating the marginalization experienced by the tail people. Uh, I was thinking about, you know, Wakant's uh, argument in, in, I think it was 2013, and although he was talking about it in the context of marginalized young people, it had parallels with disabled people because we have government object uh, agendas which are supposed to be curbing or containing or reducing the poverty and marginalization but they're also spawning those uh those precarious situations that are affecting sale people through economic choices through changes to the welfare system and I, so i think you know that there's, there's a question here about how do we ensure going forward disabled people have economic, political, cultural capital. And in one way, it is about focusing on policy and it's focusing on mandating authorities and organizations and groups to respond to the needs of disabled people. But it's also about protecting the ideas of legislation, such as uh, Sir Morris's uh, or Lord Morris's work um, in terms of uh, disabled people and chronically ill people. And it's about building from that. And that's why we should be proud of the ideals of the, of the act. And we should be celebrating and pushing for an agenda which reflects those aspirations, but also utilizes contemporary ideas such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People, thinking about how we can turn that into domestic law. So, I, you know, so going forward, on the one hand, I think it's about recognizing the, or the, the focus on human rights and the focus on rights within, within the act. And I think that's where we have to focus our attention when we think about policy. It must be orientated towards a human rights perspective, but we also should be uh, not dismissing the importance of say, the social model of disability and the recognition that the social model gives disabled people a way of articulating and, and describing that experience of disability and thus will create those necessary resistance practices to identify well where are the problems in society today and how do we return to those ideas of civil activists and pieces of legislation that have attempted to address um, the, 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 the barriers faced by the civil people. So 
And I, and I think you know, an example of that, and this is where I'll end now, an example of that I think is, is something quite exciting by the, the work of people like Waddington and Priestley, uh, who argue for a, a, a human rights approach to thinking about assessments. So if we go back to the beginning with the, with the act, we can see an orientation towards assessing need, understanding need, and providing people with the, relevant, with the right level of support so people can do the things that they want to do with their life. And I think where we are today is discussing, well, how do we entrench those ideas within our assessment procedures, within our education systems, within our labor market, in order to create more opportunities so that sale people can participate and most importantly, can be valued members of their community. Because there's no point having pieces of legislation or acts where we are just keeping sale people alive or we're just ensuring that basic needs are being met. We're thinking about how do we support sale people to be active and valued contributors in their society, which is what we've been demanding for for many years and what we'll probably continue to demand as we go forward. So I hope that was useful and uh, we'll raise some discussions later on. Miro, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your comments and for sharing your thoughts. I'm really glad you, as a social movement scholar myself that you brought up the point about the role of disabled activists in terms of pushing from below to get these changes. And I hope indeed we'll talk about how austerity policies have affected all of this. Um, so I will now, um, actually there was one question I was asked to put to you, Miro. For, um, it's a small question of clarification. You mentioned a professor working on early disability transport, Professor Simon. I, um, si Simon McEwen. At TSA so, I mean, University. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Um, so yeah, there's a lot in what you said that I hope we'll return to in the discussion. Um, now I would like to invite Dr. Gareth Millward to please um, take the stage and share your thoughts. Over to you, Gareth. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to Debbie, Armin and Nicholas for inviting me uh, and for Rachel, Susan and Heather for the great work that they're doing with the interpretation and with the captioning. Um, you read off the CVs to start with, and it made me realise that uh, I have done far less with my life than other people have. And I'm, I'm here as somebody that has gone into the archive for far too long and read far too much about the actual ways that people were talking about the act. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will provide some kind of background and uh, give us something for the Q&A uh, later. But um, particularly uh, a lot of the stuff that Miro has said uh, I feel like is going to be uh, reset. Um, the thing that I wanted to get across really was that the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act was of its time. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I don't mean that to dismiss its legacy, good and bad. In fact, as I'll go on to say, I think there were some things that were of its time that are really worth holding on to and that we need to pay attention to. But I think it's also worth stressing that where there are weaknesses with the act, it's not it's because the act was never designed to be a perfect thing that was going to solve everybody's problems. I say all that because you might now expect me as the academic historian rather than the politician or rather than the disability studies scholar to now tell you it's very, very complicated and it's not as simple as you think it is because that's what academic historians do. We try to pretend that everything's more complicated than it really is. But that's not what I'm here to do. And it wouldn't even be original for me to tell you that the act didn't do everything. As Miro has already shown, plenty of people have attacked it since it was first passed. Uh, it was accused of being lightweight without the powers needed to enforce its clauses. It didn't provide any new money for services. It didn't compel local authorities um, to provide those services. And because it had a focus on access to services and focused on people's health conditions, there were some criticisms that maybe it's still in a way held on to the medical model and saw disabled people as users of services and reliant upon services, rather than explicitly focusing on discrimination. Although again, as Miro and, uh, and Jill have, have shown, the language in the act could be used for human rights and could then be taken forward. All of this to say that the real power in the act is what it represents. It wasn't just tokenism it did something. And it had a movement of disabled people behind it, including, uh, including the work of disabled people and allies like Alf Morris to back it up. It was part of a wider movement that had been gaining 
speed since the mid 1960s. Disabled people had begun to organize and demand better treatment from the welfare state. In 1970, we see this chronically sick and disabled persons act, but at the same time in the background, the Department of Health and Social Security under labor and conservative governments was putting in motion new benefits for disabled people that would start to come online from the early to mid 1970s. Protests against abuse in mental health institutions, particularly a crisis at the Ely Hospital in Cardiff, meant that there was a growth of demands for what we would now see as care in the community or independent living, and an emphasis on disabled people being entitled to live independent lives. The changes that came in the 1970s were focused on social security in the 1980s with independent living, in the 1990s with civil rights, and in the 2000s with the disability rights movement. But none of that would have been possible without building on the work of people like Alf Morris and the disabled people who backed him and the work that they did in and outside of Parliament. Progress, if that is a meaningful term, wasn't linear. Rights and services have been won and lost across the decades and disabled people have had many arguments and I'm sure will continue to have arguments about what the correct path is that the activism should take. But if there's any chance for meaningful improvement in disabled people's lives through the British democratic process, then this act represents that completely. The act was a statement of intent, crucially in a language that policymakers could understand. It was a statement that Alf Mar and the people who supported him were able to force the government to make. They managed to rush it through before the 1970 general election, as, as Jill has said. And it represents, in effect, the start of what we would now call disability policy. Disability policy becomes a thing, a concerted focus on the needs and rights of disabled people as a class, rather than what we had before then, which was this hodgepodge of health, employment and social security policies that affected individuals who might happen to have a health condition. I think we often underestimate how important that is because until a political issue can be identified and labeled, there can't be any political solutions to it. Although there may be dangers of things getting pigeonholed, which again, we might talk about in the Q and A. We should then remember the act as a watershed, not entirely for what it did, but for the conversations it allowed the British people to have. Laws don't change things on their own, but they can start as well as reflect much more meaningful conversations in our politics, culture and society. By changing the terms of the discussion, disability became something the government could see and therefore something the British people could demand that it acted upon. And that's the first step really to meaningful democratic change. So we should remember that the act was of its time. Uh, it used a private members bill system because that was the most effective way of getting the government to commit to disability. And as an aside that I put on here, as I was uh, looking through my notes earlier, uh, Alf Morris is the only person to have got two public members, uh, private members bills through in the same year. He also managed to pass an act about um, food and uh, milk standards in 1970, which is, it was incredible that he managed to get one act through and he managed to get two, which I think is, I think that's just amazing. But anyway, that's not about today. Built the uh, Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, not the Milk Act, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, uh, built coalitions with groups who were campaigning for better social security, because those social security groups were the ones that were the most powerful disabled led groups at the time. Uh, it focused on medical conditions and state services, because that was the language the British state was using at the time. By the 1990s, Harry Barnes, Roger Berry and others would try and pass civil rights bills because in the 90s, it was the civil rights activists that the ones that, that had the sort of the momentum behind them and the political climate had shifted. So what I mean to say is that I think if Alf Morris was going to try and do something like this today, or if a budding Alf Morris wants to do something like this today, I think he'd look at what disabled people were demanding. He'd tailor his approach according to what was needed, what was achievable, and ultimately what he believed was right. It would attempt to translate disabled people's voices into the language of Westminster and Whitehall so that action could be taken. Like the 1970 Act, I've no doubt if somebody tried to do this again, it wouldn't be perfect. It would be a compromise, it would be pragmatic, and it would be of its time. But like the 1970 Act, it would help steer the political conversation in Westminster and Whitehall towards the needs and rights of disabled people in this country and it would be part of a process. It wouldn't be enough on its own, not enough without robust campaigning within and outside Parliament. But then I think that was something that Alf Morris knew all too well about his own act as well. 
I'm not going to take my full 10 minutes here because I think uh, both Jill and Miro have uh, done such a good job that I'm going to stop there and uh, allow reflections and get into the Q&A. But um, I think that's that's the real thing about the, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act is that while you can say, okay, it didn't solve all the problems overnight, the, the catalyst that it represents, I think, is, is really important, as Jill has said, not just in this country, but internationally as well. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion that comes from this. So thank you very much. Thanks, Gareth. Um, that, that was very informative. And I think, again, you know, an act never solves everything, right? So I think that's, it links to what Miro was saying, the, the need for constant struggle. It's never finished. It's always um, ongoing. So I would like to invite all three speakers um, initially to reflect on each other's presentations and um, to ask each other questions. And then I've got some great questions um, sent to me by the audience and I'll turn to those. So um, Jill, would you like to begin reflecting and then we can go down? Yeah, I sort of might liven it up a bit because I sort of take issue with Gareth and his interpretation <laughs> of what, all this great work that was happening in the 1960s. That's just not the case. It really is not. Um, and uh, of course, the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act was of its time. But if you look at the Hansard, if you look at the coverage, if you look at the intention, if you look at the principle, it unlocked something that wasn't happening. It unlocked that visibility and the right, which Myra talked about, for change and the, that public acknowledgement. Of course, it wasn't perfect. I can't think, I've been lobbying all my life. <laughs> I haven't seen one piece of legislation that is perfect. But what it did, there wouldn't have been a United Nations uh, uh, a charter, an international charter, there wouldn't have been a Disability Discrimination Act. The Roger Berries and Harry Barnes were all my father's protégés. And I will say that even till his death, he was still trying to start off another private member's bill with, um, uh, um, and, and carry on to improve what he started. It was unfinished work, it always was. But if you also, cast our minds forward, and you touched on as, as well, Armin, is that a lot of that has been taken away. That fight that you saw and uh, has been, uh, you've seen on the TV footage with people chain themselves to the railings, uh, you know, that whole feeling, um, you know, it's, I don't, I actually understand that people are angry, but they should be angrier. And I would say it's all, it was all legislation. It has to be work in progress, but you need one person or one vision or one commitment to get people on board. And, uh, you know, the fight, I'm, <laughs> I'm not, no way will I say it was a perfect piece of legislation, but I see it as, the most fundamental piece of legislation uh, that I think this country has ever seen in terms of bringing around some equality or some opportunity and mobility and accessibility and independence and life that just wasn't there. So, sorry, I'm getting quite passionate there. <laughs> Now, I think it's it's important to have this debate, and I think, you know, the point you've raised is, is important. Um, since Jill has, has made some comments to your presentation, Gareth, I'm going to turn... Um, I think I was being invited to speak, but Armin has uh, frozen. Um, Jill, I completely agree with you, and I, I'm really sorry if you felt that I was saying anything different. Um, that, that was my entire point, was that if Alf Morris hadn't been the one that had been able to get this catalyst going, if this piece of legislation hadn't been put on the books, the rest of the stuff doesn't happen. Um, I, I absolutely don't want to say that... Uh, I, I, I wasn't trying to suggest that by, by saying that the, the piece of legislation wasn't perfect, that therefore it was irrelevant. Far from it. Um, 
what, what I meant to say was that, uh, that this is a catalyst and it's very important. Um, what I meant to say by saying that there was other campaigning going on at the time was really to try and reflect that although there was stuff going on at the time, it's not that it, that, that needed some kind of voice put to it, but to, to kind of give that wider context that none of these things were happening in a vacuum. Um, but absolutely not to diminish the act or ALF in any way whatsoever. And I have been reading the, uh, the Hansard and all of the other things that were going on at the time. I know the work that ALF did to make sure that that came through. And if that wasn't given enough space, then I absolutely apologise. There's no need to apologise. I just want to reinforce that point to everybody because it does naturally, I think, uh, a lot of attention goes on often to the uh, Dis Disability Discrimination Act, but basically the biggest fight was in 1970 or 1969 to get that first, you know, to get that unlocked and get some of those prim principles and that visibility. Um, it gave disabled people passion um, and a sense of justice, which hitherto hadn't existed and I think that's the most significant thing and maybe it took a piece of legislation to do that but I think I, I mean I'm sure you didn't mean that but I just wanted to emphasize that uh, I think that people you know what I want is pe to people acknowledge uh, that that piece of legislation was so significant and by the way it's not private members legislation. there's lots of other bits of legislation and that way he was a prolific uh, legislator um, uh, on, on a manner of things and a no number of causes from contaminated blood to gulf war syndrome i can go on and on but we're here to talk about <laughs> the chronically sick and disabled persons act so um there you go Thank you. And sorry, I don't know what happened to my internet, but I just got kicked out of Zoom. So I'm back now. Um, Gareth, uh, did you did you respond to Jill because I was out? Uh... Yes, I did. I have, okay. uh, have okay. apologised profusely. Okay, thank you. Um, Miro, would you like to to, to pose any questions? Um, and uh, then... In terms of reflection, I, you know, I, I think something to pick up on, on, on Jill's point, that importance of responding to where we are now and and you know Jill made the important point about the, the the forms of direct action that are taken by activists chaining or protesting in various ways creating blockades and there is there has been a, a collapse of that um where, you know, in contemporary society and we can obviously you know explore the different reasons for that and, and one will be the the the, the I, I i would argue that the retent uh, the retraction of welfare regime and the and the emphasis placed on conditionality now has, has caused a lot of people not to get the right level, level of support, which would ultimately affect people's access to um, engaging in, in forms of either campaigning or, or protest or other forms of activism. But I think what's important about the legislation, and indeed every, every, any act of legislation, but if we're focusing today on, on the chronically sick and disabled persons act, what you have is a focus on rights, a focus on what is possible. And what happens then is that sale people start to mobilize with the resources available to them. They start to question those unnecessary barriers. And that happens before the act, but it also continues that beyond the act as well. But what the act shows is to say, well, actually, things are possible. They can be changed. And therefore, we want further changes. And we want changes that uh, are related to different groups, young people's. Uh, demands, older people's demands, those from from non-white backgrounds or non, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of hierarchical nature of of, uh, of impairments and and so people's community. So I think what we have is 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 a is a, the important point I'm trying to make is that there is a way to understand the importance of legislation, not just in making or affecting specific groups in that moment, but it also creates then the conditions for further possibilities that need to be realized. I think that's when you then start to see, you know, broader focus on, on legislation. And we have that, you know, in domestic law in terms of DDA and, 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 and the Equality Act and so on. And in, at an international level, we then see you know, disabled people being pioneers of 
of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of, of Disabled People. And for those who either are not focused on rights or perhaps are critical of rights, because we have to recognize there are disabled activists who are very critical about emphasizing or focusing on a, on a rights-based agenda. We see other forms of inter interaction and intervention focused on affecting policy, changing policy, reflecting on, on uh, broader demands associated with a radical overhaul of, of the economic arrangements and, and political arrangements and so on. But the point I think is that you know, this creates possibility then for change. And that's what I, you know, I think we should really celebrate. And the situation is dire uh, today. It's dreadful for the sale people. On a personal level, I'm terrified every day of, uh, of having my, my, my personal assistance cut, of having changes to my, to my provision of support. But th that creates the imperative then to mobilize and to continue discussing. And I think what we need to do going forward is to bring more disabled people into the conversations, to politicize, to politicize our identity as disabled people, and then reflect on what is it that we're, we're trying to achieve? What does, what does an inclusive and accessible society look like? We've got the foundations in the act, we've got foundations in the ideas of disabled people's uh, um, organizations, but we have to continuously have that conversation to create more pressure on policy. Thanks, Miro. Really important point. Um, I'm now going to turn to the audience's questions. Um, they've been posted in the chat for me. So I'll begin. The first question is to you, Jill. Um, Jules writes, um, you commented on the title of the act being outdated language. Is this a factor in the anniversary not being given the profile it deserves and the DDA taking the spotlight? And yeah, so that's that's a question over to you, Jill. Um, yeah, I mean, possibly, but as I said, you know, when you actually think about it, those were the terms of the day. I mean, you know, language like um, I was looking through the um, the archive that Indy uh, has has prepared, and you know, one of the papers is called Spastics News. Now, that is not a term that anybody would use these days. I can go on. Um, from, you know, mongoloid, cripple, that whole thing about language, you know, um, you know, but chronically sick actually was, as I said, was a condition at the time, but, you know, what it was, was about independence and disability opportunity and rights. And I think, yeah, um, it, people now call it CSDPA, but don't, people don't know what it means, but, I mean, you can't change the act. And I know why it had that long-term condition sort of emphasis as well as a quite an inclusive emphasis because it was very broad on, you know, people complained, said, oh, well, you know, you know, dysle dyslexia isn't gonna, isn't a, or autism isn't a disability as such. And then so if, it, if it's not a disability, well, it's not gonna cost you very much, is it? This is to the then Secretary of State for, for Health who is complaining ar ar around it. So yeah, I mean, language is so important and maybe that was a way, another thing that has happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe Jules is right. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm quite happy for the Disability Discrimination <laughs> Act to be celebrated as long as, um, you know, people understand that that wouldn't have happened. It really would not have happened without uh, the 1970 legislation. And I'm, you know, absolutely 100% sure of that. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Um, the second question comes from Abby Pearson, and it's to anyone on the panel. And I think, Mira, you were talking about human rights already. The question is, um, does anyone on the panel think the act offers a way to draw focus to bringing a human rights approach to disability within domestic legislation, perhaps mirroring the Convention on the Rights of Peoples with Disabilities? I think, I think it offers a potential to do that. Uh, I think the focus has to be now on trying to take the articles of the UNCRPD and, and place them in domestic law. Um, and we have, you know, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission are, are, are advocate, have, have been advocating publicly for that. We have the disability strategy that's due out next year. And we'll, we'll see what element of, of advancing or at least protecting disabled people's rights 
are in are in the strategy, although I, I probably wouldn't hold my breath that, that much for that. But the key thing is how to take the aspirations. You know, if we think about the UNCRPD, how do we take the aspirations of you know the, the various focuses it has on inclusive education? On accessible work, uh, work and labour market, on you know access to political participation. How do we take those articles and those aspirations that underpin those articles and reflect them within our daily experiences? And that requires an assessment of legislation, and it requires an assessment of previous legislation and where there has been pockets of activity and where there has been concerns and problems and when things haven't gone far enough, as we talked about today. But there's also a recognition on the on the role of 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 policymakers to understand the significance of the acts. And I think this is something that Gareth made, which I think is really important. You know, we have legislation, but to tell people there is, you know, a fairly, I'm thinking, I've been reminded by, you know, people like Professor Luke Clement, who talks about, you know, the, the, the infrastructure for legislation to tell people is fairly strong. The problem is in its application. And the problem comes from the way that policymakers, public bodies and organizations either don't enforce, they don't reflect, or they don't include disabled people in the conversations around how to make accessible and inclusive societies. So we have to, on the one hand, emphasize the importance of legislation, but we also have to think about how do we turn that into practical solutions on the ground. And for sometimes that will be providing services, but sometimes it will be around reorientating a human rights focus on policy. And it will also include things like Ensure, as the act, you know, as, you know, in terms of the Disabled Persons Act, ensuring that so people are part of the conversation and are involved in the and given the support to take considerable positions of influence and power and authority on over their lives and over the lives of the disabled people's community and society. Thanks, Miro. Thank you. I'm going to pose two questions because I know um, time is kind of drawing to a close. We finish at seven fifteen. So one question is, uh, it's again from Abby, and um, what do you think that activists, lawmakers, and policymakers can do to encourage people to engage with data gathering? The current approach is very much tied up with fear and surveillance. Do we think society is different now, generally, regardless of political affiliation than in the 70s? So one is about how people engage with data gathering and the, you know, the fears around um, surveillance. And the second question is also around politics. It comes from Paul Dark, um, who asks, has the left failed to be progressive for disabled people and why? So a very interesting, but short question. So who would like to, to go? I, I can start. I'm happy to, to, to start, although I'm conscious I've, I've probably taken a lot of the um, of the time for discussion already. Um, should I take what? Which question should I take first? I... Um, do you want to take the first question about the data? Yeah. So I think that yeah, there needs to be a, a realistic assessment. We are already live in a society where our data is continuously being collected. You know. We, all we have to do is read the terms and conditions of Zoom, and we'll understand that. Or you know, using social media and so on. Um, I think there needs to be a recognition that health, you know, particularly in, in health and social care, and that's an area that I, I work in, there has been an emphasis placed on the technological transformations that are going to be happening within that. So data is being collected. I suppose the question is, how do we ensure that the data is provided in accessible and open spaces to allow for either scholars engaged in disability studies or you know, activists or detailed people's organizations have an opportunity to be part of that discussion surrounding what the data is that is, is for and, um, and and what what potential is there to further disabled people's inclusion within society. The problem is, is that we will continue to collect data irrespective of what people's views are on that. The, the important point is that we can't allow the conversation to be occupied by those who do not see inclusion as a priority, who do not see a focus on disabled people's participation within society. And there are still people, I think, doing unproductive work surrounding disability, who are continuing with institutionalization agendas, we see that across the globe, who are dismissive or ambivalent towards the needs of disabled people. And if we don't 
mobilize on an activist level and on a research agenda level to ensure that we are thinking about this within the context of rights and within the context of a social model approach, then the danger is that the, the data will be manipulated towards justifying the various ways in which disabled people are continued to be marginalized and oppressed in society. Thanks, Miro. And on the second question, very quickly, do you have a comment on? Well, I think that I think the left, more broadly speaking, has failed to offer a coherent vision for how society should be organized. That creates a mess. And I think it also uh, there's a problem on the left in terms of including disabled people. I think the concept of disability offers a really unique way of reimagining what it means to be a human being and what it means to be a valued human being in society. And I think the broader conversations on the left outside of disability should engage with disabled activists. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jill and then Gareth. Yeah, I just think um, on the, going back to the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, I mean, one of the key parts of the act and moving forward is that actually local authorities just didn't know how many disabled people there were. They had no records. So they, it was a bit like, you know, a bit like COVID really. They didn't know how, <laughs> how to de deal with the problem because they didn't even know the extent of the problem. So I think that's just a, an aside. And I think, you know, moving forward, we do need to have a better sense of the scale of the problem. Uh, I don't know what the answer is um, at all on that basis, but I do know if you're going to tackle a problem, you need to know the scale of it or, or have a pretty good idea of the size of the problem. Um, on the um, is the left on the left or the right? I mean, my 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 thing on that it, it should disability should not be um, frankly party political. Um, you know, uh, in all those years, uh, you know, my dad was very careful to bring on conservatives or whoever from all parties to get behind that. So that's a broader point, but yeah, I mean, I would equally say the Labour Party does need to embrace that equality uh, agenda again but it's a much the bigger picture is literally around awareness um, and understanding and I think that's where the focus really must be because people need to understand that is not a niche group this is not a couple of people that they may have may know or whatever this is everybody this is about everybody and everything and those opportunities it it disability could you know happen uh you know tomorrow or the next day but in some way or form we will always not we are not get, we are going to have to so one extent or another a disability whether it's eyes ears whatever as we just by virtue of our age so i think that awareness and i think very much on the point around social care as well or, Myra's point is people need to understand that they that is something that is not niche it's a it's a big problem not just in the UK but across the world and people need to to prepare we need to governments basically need to see that as an essential and also understand the value and worth to the economy of dis disabled people and keeping people in good work and good jobs. So it's not all about welfare support and it's actually the contribution that people are making. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Um, Gareth, you wanted to reply. Over to you. Yeah, I, um, I think actually if we're, if we're looking for uh, not necessarily blueprints, but at least some evidence of how it might be done, I think Alf Morris's story over the 60s and 70s offers quite a good way for both the left to think about what options might be available, but also this question of gathering data. Um, Morris was a big proponent of making sure that what's now the Office of National Statistics actually counted how many disabled people were in the country, which started in the late 60s, was published in the early 70s. And that allowed the government then to see the scale of the problem and to try and work on, on some solutions. And then when Morris became the Minister for the Disabled in 1974, he spent his five years in office pretty much constantly talking to every single department in 
uh, in government. Like the internal memos are, are fascinating, the way that he was, he was talking to every single department in a way that you don't get with most departments. They stick to their own little silo and try and do their own thing. But he was constantly pushing forward uh, a, a sort of a proto version of what we would now think of as the social model of talking about discrimination in very sort of social democratic terms as, as this being uh, it being a structural issue that needs to be overcome by structural solutions, not by simply thinking of this as a medical problem or a problem inherent to an individual. Um, and when you consider there was a massive oil crisis on at the time and there were massive restrictions on local and national spending, the fact that he was still able to get agreements with various uh, departments across government and then to commission uh, other investigations into the restrictions against disabled people and to start to push for more and better data collection also that the, the problems could be identified and something could be done about them. Um, you know, I, I don't believe you can just transpose what was going on in 1969 and it will work in 2020. Um, but I do think that kind of social democratic way of approaching this problem as a need to translate the real problems that people have and the real problems in our society into language that people in Whitehall and Westminster can understand. That's something I think that I see in people like Alf Morris and Jack Ashley, and I don't see, maybe I'm being unfair, but I don't see that going on today in the same way. And maybe if we can recapture some of that spirit, we might get somewhere. It's, there's a really interesting point about the nature of the politics. Um, thanks, Gareth. I have another question from some um, Jules Husi, who asks, this is a question, she's directing it to you, Miro. Do current disability politics, policies, and campaigns engage fully with the hierarchy of disability? ALF's act brought autism and neurodivergence into politics for the first time, but are those with learning disabilities um, difficulties still largely invisible and unheard? So brought the hierarchy. Yeah, that's a great question. There is a hierarchy within, um, well, I've said the first area in terms of disability politics. There is a hierarchy. There is, I, there, there tends to be an emphasis placed on typically white, uh, middle class, university educated, physically impaired individuals who occupy and monopolize the conversation surrounding um, disabled people's activism and the, and the, the broader attempts in, in policy. Uh, my research uh, is predominantly around the people's experiences of disability activism, and what struck me in my um, in my PhD research was talking to uh, black black activists, old and young, who talked about the 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 fact that in any conversation surrounding disability activism, they felt like they had to erase the identity of the black person to fit in and to discuss. And I think that shows us that intersectionality, whilst those perhaps in academia will talk about its importance, it's not, that's not reflected in, in activism and social movements. And I think that if we are going to survive as disabled people's movement, we have to emphasize the importance of embracing intersectionality and recognizing that within our community, there are, there are, we are, we are, you know, the disabled people's community is invisible to an extent, you know, we are marginalized, we are, dismissed and forgotten about but even within that dismissed group there are invisible there are invisible people and there are voices that have been um silenced and shut down and you know people with learning disabilities is, is a prime example of that in terms of leading on campaigns and so on so yes i think there is a need to reflect on the hierarchies and then understand the 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 nuances of what policy is trying to achieve and to embrace that intersectionality within policy making intersectionality is very rarely engaged in in the policy making process. Why? Because often policy orientates around the ideal individual. So, you know, it typically uh, creates uh, the, the, the standardized version of a disabled person and then, or, and then creates policy approaches around that. We really need to rethink and be quite radical and creative in our policy making to take account of those marginalized experiences and the ways that they intersect and the, the way that they create new experiences and unique experiences when we bring together marginalized characteristics. 
Thank you. I'm really glad you brought up the point of intersectionality and the inequality within movements. I think that's a really important point. Um, we're getting near the end of time. I have another question just posted. Um, the, you know, what are your thoughts on initiatives such as the Sunflower Scheme, where people living with an invisible disability have the option to self-identify themselves in different settings? Do you see this as a positive empowering step or does it exacerbate othering? Um, the question is coming from Sadie Hurst. So I don't know who wants to take that question. Um, Mira, I know you've spoken a lot, so I wanted to ask if anybody else also wants to come in on that. If uh, not, I... <laughs> I think it's, a, uh, I think it's a, a tough one. I think I'm more, in, more keen to comment on the invisibility point of uh you know that people not everybody it's not always a physical di disability and all of the the, the the spectrum that Mira was talking about and I think that is a huge problem I mean again you've seen a little bit around the COVID pandemic of people sort of uh you know um it's not always obvious for example why they're not wearing a mask or they might have an underlying health condition or whatever so it's the same sort of process of you know and I, I suppose what I worry about is a bit like the labeling thing is that a positive thing or not I'm not I'm really not sure what the answer is um in terms of human rights and whether you know that's a positive thing or not but I mean generally speaking I, I boil my, my thing is about you really need positive uh awareness um and better understanding i suppose but anyway i don't know what i mean I... okay thanks jill mira do you want to comment or gareth gareth i mean I, I i really don't feel like it's my place to comment as a not yet disabled person uh to be able to say what other people should be doing i i my my default position is always, as long as this is being led by disabled people, I'm happy to try and help. Um, but I'm not, I, I, yeah, that, that's not a question for me to answer. Thanks, Gareth. As, as, well, I'm conscious of time, so I, I think it's a really important point to reflect on. Um, I suppose my, my view is that we have to ask the question, why is there a necessity? Or why do people feel that they have to um, either have these public labels uh, used? I think it's, it speaks to a broader point about the way that we acknowledge the variance in human existence and the variance in the way that we um, function and engage in our environments. And often, you know, policy and, broad, and you know, in other areas of, of the built environment, people assume that there is a certain way which is normalized, which is seen, perceived as preferred way to function and behave in society. The neurodiverse movement has demonstrated that actually we should be embracing the variance in the way that we process information, the way that we function, the way that we live our life. And I'd rather emphasize the importance of society reflecting and embracing the variance rather than saying that some people feel that they have to be labeled or place a badge on themselves to justify why they are existing in, in, a, in a way that they, they want to exist or they have to exist. Thanks. Thank you. Sadly, we are at the end of our um, session um, today, and it's been incredible listening to all of you and to the question and, and your responses to the questions as well. I want to thank you, um, all of you, Jill, Gareth, Mike, Miro, for your presentations. And um, it's just been a really lovely evening. And thank you again for taking part. And we're very grateful that you could find the time in your busy schedule to be with us today. And um, just to say again, um, you know, we will try to make this event online um, available as a podcast, um, notwithstanding any um, hiccups with the technology, which I experienced myself this evening. But apart from that, um, just to thank everyone, Rachel, Susan, for your interpretation and um, for helping us this evening. So thank you very much. Any last words, folks, from the speakers?
wherever possible, just keep engaging in, in political activism. Just thank you all for putting it on and uh, let's keep going. Lovely. Thank you. And um, thanks also for um, the LSE events team for putting information in the chat about the exhibition. And please follow them for also the information on the podcast. And everyone have a great evening. Thank you again for your contributions.